How's your brain today? Really, how is your brain? We're going to do something with your brain. In fact, we're going to have some fun and do lots of somethings with your brain today. We're going to talk about how to take control of your own brain's future. We start with some good news. You are living in what will forever be known as the golden age of brain science. Neuroscience has been described as the most exciting frontier of human knowledge since the Renaissance. And this golden age has matured to a point that it's a, it, a new subfield has emerged, and it's called applied brain science. We're learning how to apply the science to real-life challenges. So let's start by using your brain with a quiz. Fill in the blanks. Use it or... Easy, be easy. Those words were used in the dark ages of neuroscience in the 1960s by a fearless pioneer, Marion Diamond. She used them to describe neuroplasticity, the ability of your brain to change its very structure at any age. What she discovered was that enriched environments create enriched minds. It's now use it and improve it. Now, before we improve your brain, I need to share a little bit of advice with you. And that is, that's advice that my students take to heart. And that's, when it comes to your brain, be courageously honest. Don't mess around with it. And when I talk about courageously honest, I want you to answer this question and be honest. How many of you, raise your hands, have walked into a room in the last five days and forgot what you went in there for? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, um, this, is, this is brain science. Those few of you who didn't raise your hands, how many of you can't remember walking into the room? <laughs> because it happens to everyone, and it's not related to memory loss. So it's actually that you're multitasking. You're trying to think of too many things at once, or somebody interrupted you. You got distracted as you went in. So don't worry about it. What you should worry about is the future of your brain next year, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 50 years. How old will you be in 50 years? <laughs> Holy smokes, how old am I going to be in 50 years? <clears throat> you know, I don't worry about that because I know about the oldest living human being ever to be documented, Madame Jean Calmat from France lived a robust, full life to the age of 122 and a half years old. I'll have whatever the heck she had. <laughs> now, do you want to know one of her secrets? At a, when in her late teens, that's 117, she, she revealed one of her secrets. And that was, you ready for this? Chocolate. How's that? But not any chocolate. It was dark chocolate, and she ate how much? A kilo a week. Do you know how much that is? That's two pounds a week. But she didn't eat it all on a Thursday or a Saturday. She ate smidgens, bite-sized pieces, all day, every day. Science then revealed, after she passed away, that it opens up the capillaries to the brain. It made her brain and her heart healthier. She did what we need to know how to do and what to do. We're learning. Here's some more good news. Listen carefully. The best way to predict your brain's future is to create it yourself. After decades of trying, there is no pill, there's no tonic, and nobody in this room, nobody on earth has enough money to buy their way out of cognitive decline. What you have to do is to create positive some things that you're going to do. You create your own future. What you'll do is to create a smidgen of something, and then two, and then five, and pretty soon you're cultivating brain-healthy habits that will last you your entire lifetime. And every smidgen counts. That comes from something I teach my students, and it's called the power of a smidgen. It comes from my dad. My dad, I can still hear him say this to me, 
A smidgen isn't much unless you do a smidgen every day. And if you do seven smidgens a week, and if you do 30 smidgens a month, you'll make a difference in this world. So what's a positive smidgen? You're here. You're here. That's a positive smidgen. This TEDx talk is actually a date with your brain. You're taking your brain on a date <laughs> to, a, to a happy hour, and they're serving, they're serving brain-healthy food for thought. So what do you want to do? How about this? Fall in love with your brain. Do it quickly. Do it now. Do it for the rest of your life. You're also building today a knowledge base that will allow you to know that knowledge is power. Those three words were coined in the first renaissance. And what, we're in the, what this new renaissance is actually offering is a way to understand what puts your brain at risk and also understand what strengthens your brain. But all that knowledge would sit on the shelf unless you use it, unless you act on it, unless you apply it. And once you start applying it, things happen. Now, I started exploring this brand new frontier in 2001 when I found a calling at an assisted living community as an activity director. I was 30 minutes on the job and realized that these residents were bored. Their brains were not being challenged. So what I did was to develop an activity program that enriched the entire community. I base it on the five senses. Aerobics, aerobics, scent aerobics, taste aerobics, and touch aerobics. I called it memorobics, and pretty soon a researcher heard about it, asked if he could do a clinical trial. Two years later, I'm dog paddling in the deep end of neuroscience looking for a snorkel so I can go down and understand this. I learned a new language called neuroscience, and then I figured out a way to translate that into a second language called plain English. <laughs> I, I learned that brain science is, isn't rocket science. It's a lot harder. We have been to the moon. We could get to Mars if we wanted to spend enough money. But what we have now is a problem of whether or not we can solve that before we die of something else. So it's going to be a do-it-yourself battle until something comes along. That's the bad news. The good news, evidence-based good news, is that you can improve your health by doing what? Change the way you treat your brain. TLC. Treat it right. Your brain is going to be with you how long? For the rest of your life. And that's why I remind you, fall in love with your brain, starting with the evidence. And here's the evidence. Right now, what we know is that you have six key areas of brain science. And those are how you move, how you think, how you relate to others, how you cope with challenges, what you eat, and how you sleep. Once you know that your health is driven by what we call a series of cognitive wheels or cog wheels, you'll understand that they all act on each other. Now, if one of these six cog wheels fails, but the other five are healthy, you're in trouble. And if one of them is wobbly, you better pay attention before it fails. What if one of them loses a few teeth? Your brain will get by, maybe, but if it fails, you are in trouble until you do what? Something. Do something about it. You need to address all of these cogwheels in combination. We call it combinatorial. And that concept was proven by a brilliant study from Sweden. That terrific study, in that study, Mia Kivi Pelto and her team designed a study that, allowed, that used three of these six cogwheels and they interacted on each other. The results after two years with was that the participants, the participants' baselines compared with what happened in two years went off the charts. They were significantly improved. It was as though there was a synergy that affected the multiple use and the combinations. That synergistic effect concluded what we now know from that study and others, that we can prevent cognitive decline. I'll let that sit for just a minute. Does that stimulate your brain to want to do something? I hope it does. 
because it's in your control. Because every time that something stimulates your brain, anything, your brain has a sequence of electrical charges, like a Pony Express, that's going to express chemicals, either good or bad. There's over a hundred neurochemicals that have been discovered. They're in your brain right now. Some of the best known are dopamine, serotonin, cortisol, endorphins, oxytocin. But to help promote your brain's health, you have to learn what? How to control those faucets that are in your brain. How to learn to regulate the negative ones and to stimulate the positive ones. That's the control that science gives you. So let's Express some positive chemicals right now. What's your first phone number? You thinking about it? Your brain just expressed some chemicals. Let's go to the next one. What's the name of your favorite grade school teacher? Be thinking about that. Raise your hand if you got it. You've some... That's got more chemicals because there's more emotion. See the cute little girl on the on right side, front row? Every time my wife sees that picture of her fourth grade teacher and her friend Sue in the back row in the middle, she gets chemicals that make her brain healthier. One more, one more for you. What's the name of your favorite pet of all time, your entire life? Oh, I heard some moans over here. Okay, I'm not going to pop because this room would be filled with noise, but what that is is an emotional bond that you just gushed out of your brain. When you create a gush of positive chemicals, your brain is healthier just by thinking about that favorite pet. It's like your brain is that laboratory with the faucets that you control and don't take your hands off the faucets because when your brain is stimulated by the senses or even just by thinking, you express what we've labeled a neuro squirt. <laughs> They're there you recognize them and you can generate them. Your goal on an everyday basis is get more positive neural squirts than negative neural squirt, neural squirts. After my dad's second stroke, he moved to a wonderful care facility and he applied his smidgens every chance he got. One morning he called me and called me early and said, meet me for breakfast. I got there before breakfast at 6.45 he woke me up, I drove in, and I thought there was something wrong. Here he is with a cup of coffee, and he, I said, you want me to wheel you to your table? And he said, no, grab a chair, grab a cup, let's talk. I watched him perform magic as he said good morning in a very strong, hello, good morning, to every single person who walked by. Later, the caregivers told me that my dad insisted on being the first one to come in so he could say hi, good morning to every one of them. I saw smiles. I saw people bonding for that moment, except one. One lady walked right past him. Face didn't move. He said good morning. He then whispered to me, that's okay. I know it helped her, at least a smidgen. And I know it helped me. He'd be happy to know that research has confirmed that he was right. Smidgens do mount up. They do accumulate. And I'll bet that lady's brain was healthier by just a smidgen or two because of that contact, that daily smidgen of contact. She was healthier because she got a smidgen of what? Oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is important, especially in my field of the aging mind. And that's because oxytocin is expressed when you thought of your favorite pet. It's expressed when you see a baby, even if it's not yours. It's expressed when you, when you have a moment that you smell that cinnamon roll that reminds you of your mom or your grandma exactly like they used to make it. When you have a feeling of gratitude or when you experience pure gratitude, passion, when you feel that someone has given someone else kindness, your brain pops out with that chemical. Oxytocin when you think about cuddling a baby or hug someone you are close to, you get what's called the cuddle chemical. Now babies, when they're held, get floods of chemicals. And a lot of that is oxytocin. But what about the other end of life? What about late in life? Late in her 60-year career, Marion Diamond had another brilliant out-of-the-box idea. 
Could we extend the lifetime of a being by having smidgens of regular cuddles? And what she and her research team did was to de design a study in which every day those furry little rats got a hug. And what happened? After, after the study was released, we found out that she extended the lifetime simply by those snuggles from 600 days to over 900 days. She said that that's the equivalent of extending your life from 60 years to 90 years. The expression of, of oxytocin is something that's sometimes missing because as we age especially, social bonds are disrupted. Sometimes there's a deficit in the doses of oxytocin. It's called an oxytocin deficit disorder. Some call it loneliness. Now, when you think of someone who's lonely, who's close to you, your brain reacts. So everybody think of someone right now. Think of someone. What you're doing is setting the stage to know this. Loneliness has been described as a medical epidemic. Researchers now, research now knows that the feeling of loneliness is a survival signal that's in the category of three others, and that's hunger, thirst, and pain. The consequences of loneliness, if they're ignored, are dangerous. Isolation is fatal is a term the scientists use, and it's been proven that if you're lonely or someone's lonely, their life expectancy is shortened by seven and a half years, and their health span is shortened even greater. One researcher even said that denying your lonely is just... Denying you're lonely makes no more sense than denying that you're hungry. So if you're hungry, what's your survival signal? Find food and eat it. If you're thirsty, you better find some liquid and drink it. And if you have pain, it's shouting. Your body is shouting, help, do something. But what if you're lonely? What do you do? Well, you better get those regular neural squirts of oxytocin from somebody somewhere. And when you have that oxytocin, that interrupts the chronic loneliness, just like my dad Smidgen did every morning. You're building what's called a stronger brain, a brain reserve. It's a structural safety net that's been discovered that you can start building at any and every age. The famous Nunn study showed that when nuns were autopsied on death and they found plaques and tangles in many of their brains, but when they compared it with their lives, they found some of those nuns with the hallmarks of Alzheimer's, plaques and tangles, didn't have any of the symptoms, cognitive decline symptoms. How could that be? It's because they kept their cogwheels healthy. Throughout their lives, they stay engaged. They ended up building that brain reserve, and they didn't manifest the symptoms. They masked them. So when I die at 123 <laughs> and a half, and they do an autopsy on my brain, and they find all of these plaques and tangles, but I never had the symptoms, I win. <laughs> Here's the final smidgen takeaway for you. Stay in control. Your brain changes throughout your life, both structurally and functionally, and it depends upon how you treat your brain. It depends upon the control you have over your brain. Those, those changes can be positive or they can be negative, so be courageously honest, learn how to control them, learn what puts your brain, brains at risk, and stop it. Learn what puts your brain in a stronger place and do it. Congratulations. You're all on the way to making a lifelong love affair with your brain a reality. Thank you very much. <laughs>